Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon, including new Patreon Adam Price, Fibre Oats, Bogey, Michael Kahn, Rob H, Ben White, Maximum Gravy, John Kays, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuker, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo the One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Muted, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, The Real Gabster, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Texas Mike, and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I will hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. It's kind of funny though. I don't, I don't believe it. Fill us in, Neil. Uh, TikTok and Ice Wall. Yeah, I posted in a mess to be, but um, it's just about a guy talking how he's he's uh, recording from a, a computer using a Wi-Fi internet at some hotel, but he wants to get his story out. Things that he's seen, Ice Wall higher than the Washington Monument, as far as the eye could see. <laughs> Same old stuff. I see. Very good. <laughs> the one question goes, is the earth flat? Yes. Is there an ice wall? Yes. Can you prove it? No. No. He does say photographs could be faked. Let's do a whole list of things, but... um. Yeah, I think I heard this video years ago. It's not nothing new, but it's funny how it just comes across my wife's TikTok. Hey, Ratchis. Hey. So what are you guys talking about? Are you allowed to play it or no? I put it up on screen. I didn't play it though. No, you want me to play it five seconds? I think it. Yeah, I think it's two minutes or something. Within the confines yeah. of that program, I had to see it for myself. Two weeks later, I did. The team traveled by ship. The journey was incredibly long. I mean, th that sounds like flat water, flat earth. The narrator. <sighs> sounds familiar to me too. I just I don't know the name. I don't believe he traveled there. I think he's full of shit. Who's he talking about? Bird. I thought he was talking about himself. I don't know. I, am, I haven't got a clue what this guy's babbling on about. Clearly, you weren't compelled by it, so... Yeah, it's the same old nonsense. I'm all about validation, Nathan. If you could validate it, I'm in. If you can't, I'm out. If I go and fix myself a coffee with the conversation completely die on its ass and I end up with loads of dead air on the No, screen. we'll keep talking. Go make your coffee. Yeah, you, you say that. Righteous, you there? Yeah. What do you think about the ice wall? Because I know you came around the same time. Like me, maybe a little before. There was that ice wall talk back then, right? I suppose. 
What did you think of it? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a circle mapper anymore. But when you first heard it, though, like, were you like me, like you were grabbing onto everything? I was grabbing onto it, yeah. It's only when you come yes. here, you get set straight. <laughs> it wasn't just here. Like, I don't agree with everything on here either. Don't get me wrong. But, what do but you like, mean? we're all, like, making our journey, right? And that's what I like about, like, you all respect each other and our journey. Right? How dare you that's disagree your... with me? Exactly. If you don't agree, dis... if you disagree with me, forget it. Get out. Yeah. Like at first I was like observing a lot of things and then all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, there's like deception even among our ranks, right? So you know, we just gotta learn. Yep. And you yep, know what I realized? I realized Go I ahead. realized this whole circle map, uh AE map type ideal is again fed information and they say oh all the ancient cultures believed in this and it's like well why would i believe what the pagans and unbelievers believe you know what i mean they were deceived uh, why would i follow how do we know that, deceived? How, how do we know that information wasn't fed either exactly there you go they might not even believe that either because I know that a lot of things about history is really, really dodgy. Very dodgy. I was looking at it this way. Look at 9-11, right? Now, I don't believe right. the narrative that was said, but that's going down in the history books. So 40 years from now, it, kids are going to be learning in school that a 9-11, 19 it, hijackers came in with box cutters. Exactly. And see how fast that history changed? It like, changed right before our eyes. And if it could change at that rate, you know, you would think a couple of years would have to pass by before they like switch narrative, but no, it happened like right as it was going on. Right. But what I'm saying is the false narrative is going to go in there. There's no way I will believe that something like that could happen. It's but it's going narrative. down in history. What fourth narrative? Hi, Tent. Hi, John. No, the first narrative. Good morning. My tent. Good morning. Morning. You joining us from heaven? Tenth. No, oh, no I'm... <laughs> heaven on earth is my property. That's as close as I'm getting. Till I pass away and get my new body. Oh no, it was just when you first talked. There was a load of reverb. That was all. You had a lot of God oh, in your I voice. Just, that was all. I just woke up. <laughs> yeah, same here. I just woke up too. Well, I've been woke for up for years, regardless of what these people say. What people? I'm just kidding around from yesterday with the guys that were trying to tell me how long I've been in the arena. You still going on about that? Well, they just said they, well, they been... just woke up. I said I woke up years ago. The arena, what? UFC, your your UFC fighter, Neil. I didn't know that. Yeah, FED deadly. Fighter. That's what he's talking about. FED fighter. Ah, okay, I get it. To round this up with what I was talking about, with righteous is history is we don't even know what is real and what is not real. That's all I'm saying. John, some, some history is real, and I know that because I experienced it. The only history that I know that is real is God's words, the Bible. That's about it. I agree with that. But I'm saying, just take anything. Just the, the most recent one, 9-11. What are you going to read about? What are, you re what are the kids reading about now in school? What are you going to read about 20 years from now in school? But, I don't think that's the truth. But, 
But what's the point? If the, the only history that, and the only truth that we know to be true is the Bible, then what's the matter about what's out there? No, hang on, both of you guys. There, it's a mixture always. It's truth and lies mix. So it's not just everything's a lie. I mean, the, everyone throws. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I mean, you got to be careful here. Not everything is a lie. No, I'm saying the narrative <laughs> that they put out is. Well, I know what happened there. I was there. I watched it. But uh, I don't well, yeah. believe what they're saying. Yeah, the, the narratives the government puts out and the people who are under the government in power are two different ones. And we're experiencing that now with the Charlie Vector Niner. So the whole point is you got truckers in Ottawa and Canada is just like standing up finally against it. And the narrative that you see uh, over the news, uh, at least the uh, internet news, because I don't watch TV news, um, is a totally different story than when they interview the people on the ground. So we're watching it happen. Yeah, you're not allowed to mention that, though, if it's actually happening there and then. Well, they also interviewed the people on the ground during 9-11, and they knew that there was structural damage due yeah, to we, high heat. Yeah, you got you got special <laughs> players. <laughs> JLB plays that clip quite frequently, which is a guy on the ground that knew the ins and outs of the full narrative seconds after the event happened. And he's saying that the building collapsed because of structural fires, because of the intense heat. I can't remember to <laughs> parrot it verb verbatim, but he's right there on the scene, there and then. He knows exactly yeah, what caused it. A passerby right. knows all right. the stuff. Right when you need a chemical scientist, right on the spot. Everybody dies with <laughs> him. No, this was Average Joe. <laughs> it, it was portrayed no. as like Average Joe. That just obviously Average Joe knows that, you know, the intense fire would be bend the steel structures and cause structural damage leading to the collapse of the towers. He knew that on the spot, that, like any Average Joe would. The towers that were built to withstand. Yeah, you know, I, I, anyway, let's not, let's not devolve, let's not let this descend into 9-11 discussion. I, I right, was in uh, those towers. I was at the top restaurant. Anyway, uh, I'd like to talk about the, the first step in hypnotizing a public, and that's to make them, uh, what is it called? Daddy. Unsure Daddy. of their reality. Daddy. No, it's funny you say that, because I, I think that's the problem is... People are hypnotized. Okay, how do you do that, John? How do you make people un unsure of their reality, as you phrase it? I'm fighting. You give an R value to a kitchen. <laughs> I assume you were going somewhere with that, John. That's that probably didn't the... sound like a throwaway comment, but maybe it was. No, no, it's. Uh, I was trying to change the subject over to Flat Earth with that. Because the first step is you have to get people to accept that they don't know what reality is. That way they can look to your experts to tell them. And we have a lot of experts out there. Well, we have one expert. It's called the TV and those similar medias that brainwash people. People don't think. They watch and believe. Yeah, uh, Joe Rogan had an interesting guest, the guy, the inventor of M mRNA <laughs> technology, um, and he was talking about that subject of mass, hypnoti mass hypnotization. And it's about getting the populace super focused on one subject. Mass hypnosis? Yes. But of an entire population, not just a group of people, just a very large group of people. But they, yeah, that's, what, that's happening now, obviously. <laughs> of course. But uh, the first step in that is flat Earth. You can you can get and and I'll keep it clean, uh, Nathan. You can get strangers to say hi to each other in some cities, uh, in in you know places of shopping, uh, when everything was fine. Uh, Charlie Vector Niner comes and all of a sudden strangers are walking up to you. Why why don't you have your blah 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 on? Oh, really? You got the guts to say hi now. <laughs> All right, well, I believe hypnosis starts 
talk about it right from the television. Look, I got the news on. I'm watching the weather, and there's a half a globe on as they're going over the weather. Okay, hold on. It sounds like John's forming his thoughts quite nicely. So you said it starts with flat Earth. Uh, yes, sir. It uh, the first step is to make the people doubt the reality. And what does every kid assume? I mean, when you hear about the globe, when anybody hears about the globe, they're like, they're mesmerized, almost hypnotized by the idea of it. Like, wow, I really don't know anything. You know why mesmerized know. is what it is? Mesmerized comes from a, a man called Mesmer. Who, well, you can imagine what he did. Mesmerized people. That's why his namesake is that word. Well, that was Carl Sagan on the Johnny Carson show. When I was younger, I watched it. And uh, I think you can still find it on YouTube. And he's obviously one of the guys, he was the mentor of Neil deGrasse Tyson, I believe. Uh, so the he's on the show with Johnny Carson and Johnny's asking him about things related to his subject. And he goes, yeah, we're this thing so many kajillion miles away. And this thing that's this many kajillion miles, insignificant compared to. And then it was like he was selling dire straits rather than hope. You know, it was like, we're nothing. There's nothing. You're small. Don't even talk. You know, you're just going to live and die. That was the whole premise of the whole answer from this guy. It was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, but I wasn't mesmerized. I was annoyed when they were telling me I was on a spinning water ball. I don't seem to remember um, at school, at least, uh, having the globe uh, drummed into me. I can remember some lessons vaguely. You didn't need I think it. A lot of it. I think a lot of it may come later. Uh, no, no, you know, it came earlier. It. You didn't need it. By then, you'd already got it in well and truly cemented in your mind. You didn't need it. Yeah, by your parents. Yeah, and I think even later, uh, as a, you know, children playing with toys, they give them the spaceships, and then they've got the books and the comics. So it's drummed in that way to it's get the they try and give them enjoyment uh, with toys and pleasure through it as well. All right, I think exactly. Yeah, but then when you go to school, they do the experiment there, what they call it, with the water in the bucket, whirling it over their head, and no water coming out. All I remember is just looking in like a book and seeing the layers of the lava. That's what I remember. With the thin crust, that's like, I don't know. I was just amazed. How can that thin crust, the size of like an apple crust, hold all that lava in? But, Wait, you still learn the solar system in school? I don't remember any yeah, of Yeah, we did, really. but I think what he's trying to say is he can't remember a point where they sat him down and indoctrinated him. Well, th there isn't a point, because by the time you get to school... You've already had endless amounts of heliocentric indoctrination already. Oh. So there's no need to sort of start from scratch and start telling people, by the way, you live on a ball in a ever-increasing void of nothingness. There's no point in lay laying out in that overt way when you get to school because you already know. Except I didn't have that because I come from like, I came from Europe and I had an outdoor lifestyle. So when I came to Canada and I seen that in my book, that was like, news to me <laughs> when I seen that lava and all that stuff. I, was like, I don't know how you, I I don't know how just... you do it elsewhere, but in the States, they sit you down, you're in kindergarten, there's a globe in the middle, all the kids gather around it, and the teacher says, this is where you are, and it starts from there. I'm not saying things are not uh, put in your head earlier through your parents and books and comics and cartoons, yeah, but they teach you it in school. Then they go on to the solar system. And it's taught as fact. All right. I was walking in a, a park local to me in Manchester uh, over the weekend. And even in the, it's just a park for youngsters. It's got slides and swings. And around the area, they've got the old solar system thing going on. Jupiter. And they've got rockets uh, and an astronaut on something else. Uh, and this is in the kids' playground. Just brainwashed straight away as soon as you walk in. Yeah, it's our religion, so you get it from day one, basically. And it's taken as red. Right, it's not like the... it's taught to you. It's just 
accepted and part of the language. So just by learning to speak English, you'll learn about the world being heliocentric with words like atmosphere and so on and so forth. Yeah, I was about to say it's built into the language a lot of in a lot of places. Um, but the after you can get uh, a group of people to accept that they aren't smart enough to know what's going on, then you uh, a, a fear builds out of that, you know. And from that fear, you can get them hyper uh, specific subjects to, and it'll hypnotize them. I think Nathan calls it the spell part of it, but this, there's actually a, a step one before the spell. Yeah, but how do you break the hypnosis? Hold on, go on. What's before that? Well, first you have to accept that you don't know what reality is and that you're not smart enough to figure it out. That's the, it's a, like giving up your own authority kind of deal, the question authority. Um, I think that's what the, making them confused well, you know about the reality. You know what I realized? I realized like we as humans in these bodies, we're like programmable. But I noticed we all have these checks deep down inside, but we're not sure about something, but we override those things we're not sure about. And that's how things get in. That shouldn't be getting in. We allow the long, wrong things in. Like me, when I was looking at my textbook in grade five, and I've seen that, I wasn't sure about that. That didn't make any sense, but I just kind of like overrode that. I guess everybody had to figure it out. And I went with it and I passed that check. People keep passing these checks to have in them. And slowly, slowly, they end up like off what's real and what's not just because they keep going against their instincts, right? So to say, keep it lay, man. Well, Follow that's me. what happened. In, yeah, yeah, that's what happened to me in school. And when the teacher would say something, I, I, I own my reality. I said, there's no way that works that way. And then he said, obviously, the back and forth, and you know, the rest of the story. I, I don't even believe it. I just got to teach it. I think it was when I realized flat earth, uh, I, I think I immediately realized it without no uh, sort of evidence, if you like. Um, I just, I knew. And then I like that. I didn't have to try and prove I knew it. I just knew it in my heart and my soul. And then later on, I went to look into the, the, the flat earth, um, you know, debate and uh, uh, proof and things like that and learned things about it later on but immediately i just knew yeah same here i just had a math power and mention it without it being in ridicule and instantaneously i went yeah yeah it is yeah that's right i knew immediately now i i've justified this in the past by saying well i was a rep and i was flying all over the world and looking out the back window and i've got this whole romantic story of looking over the flat plane but i think it's just instinctual for all of us we know at a base level the world that we're actually interacting with. Agreed. Yeah, and we and we know on a base level our internal experience that we're interacting with. Like for example, Brenda thinks that her immaterial consciousness is actually matter. Very interesting. You can actually convince a person that their own sentient experience is not an existence, that it's an illusion. That's how deep you can program somebody. My book, one of my books came in, Nathan. I've got a few slides. Well, I just, just before you go phone. into this, I've got the first one up, which is uh, Search and Rescue Survival, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my uh, patrons and longtime supporters dropped me an email and said, I heard you talking with Tenth about a lot of great big stack of books that he's got. Well, he's an avid collector of old books, and he wanted to know which ones were your recommendations. So that he can say, all right, well, I'll, I'll earmark and try and find this particular rare one that you th say is good for X and Y reasons. But he specifically said, can you have a little chat next time you're talking about that stack of books with Tenth um, about potentially a few recommendations for him to seek out and find for himself? Uh, and then maybe reasons why you might want to seek them out. I don't know those books you do. I've just passed the message on. Hopefully you'll do that before you get into this presentation. But I have got it up when you're ready. 
Yeah, well, that's that's that presentation I told you I was putting together. I took a picture of the books, posted it. They're, they're getting higher and higher, and I got two two came in, one more's coming in, and one came in prior to that. And uh, it's going to take more time to actually sh sh uh, do that. But, I mean, you know, I could just give them a hint and give Baldich, number one, because that's their version of... Uh, everything you need to hold know on, about hold on. stop 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 Bowditch what's the that's the author what's the full what's his full name and what's the title of the book that you specifically think he should get this is called the practical navigator Nathaniel Bowditch it's uh try right. get an older one try get an older one you can get new ones but they're like in two volumes now and they kept adding stuff like Bowditch didn't know about uh, GPS but the new ones have things about GPS so if you get an older one I think I've got a 65 version. I've got the his first 1802 downloaded on eBooks for free on my computer. You can get that from one of the archive sites. Uh, so just try to go to eBay or whatever and try to find an older one. Okay, and can you give me a couple more to recommend to this particular person? Oh my gosh, yeah, it's morning. I gotta turn on the light, hold on. <laughs> oh my God, you gotta push a button, huh? <laughs> no need. I'm asking him to do something that he hasn't prepped for. Hello, Adam, by the way. Okay. Can you hear Good afternoon, me? Good guys. And Navigation by Harold Jacoby. Uh, you can get that in paperback. That's the astronomer. Uh, there's... Uh, well, it all depends what kind of books he's interested in. If he wants yeah, algorithms... Just, just just repeat the second book, its author and its title, please. Navigation by uh, Harold Jacoby. And can you think of just one more that might be particularly rare or you found difficult to find? Yeah, Air Navigation, Volume 1, Volume 2 by the Air Force. By the Air Force? U.S. Air Force. U.S. Air Force. Yeah, you can download that on ebooks as well. But that's a book. He can. It's specifically the the physical entity of the book that I think he's interested in. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just saying if you can't find it, and for the rest of your audience, uh, you can. Some of these books are archived, and if you can't find it in print, you can still download it. Okay, so I've got search and rescue up the cover at least. Yeah. Um, again, let me let me preface that when I started this. Um, you're going to, and it kind of goes with what we, what we were talking on the show. Uh, they put truth in there, but then they have their version of the, the globe model. So they have to sh talk about the globe, but they have to also talk about how measurements are done and how angles are achieved. And so they, they do a good job of convincing you that it's working on a curved adjacent <laughs> because of the pictures, but because I knew what I was looking for. Uh, every time I, I turn the page, it's as if uh, the lies were in one color and the truth was in another color and the words were popping out. And I just kept saying, my goodness, this is so easy. You know, you just have, hold on one second. Please. No worries. We'll have some elevator music in the meantime. Dun, dun, na, 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 na. Yeah, uh, give, me, give me 20 seconds. I'll be right back. I'm back. I'm back. Sorry. Someone's looking for a set of keys. And now um, our feature presentation. So so when when you get a book like this one, Survival, Search and Rescue, you see they're talking about all the things that you see in some of the other books uh, about a globe and the uh, you know meridian lines and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden you come to stuff like this. So go to the second slide. And of course, I just took this with my camera, but uh, as you can see, what does that look like to you? Triangle. Yeah, uh, they're saying in the survival kit, you have a protractor. You could even tie a string to a branch, put a weight to get your vertical, and then create a triangle. So, well, that's interesting. That doesn't look like a curved baseline. What are these oh. from, Sam? Um, survival. Survival. 
Yeah, search and rescue, uh, Department of the Air Force. It looks curved on top. Is that just because it's the book open? Yeah, it's yeah, the deep book. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> Neil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I was, let's I be honest, right? Hold on, let's stop a lie. second. Before we poo poo what Neil's just said, right? You know that there's going to be some fundy out there that would probably assert that in the comments had Neil not done it for him. So it's a reasonable thing to say. Only because that's, of the level of our opponents. Carry on. That's what I was laughing at, mate. It was just like a. <laughs> Baller coming in and going. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what you expect from a baller. Yeah, but look at the book. It's curved. <laughs> oh, all right. So anyway, next one. Do you, do you see the next one? Uh, yeah. Just talking about the big, the big uh, Dipper, Cassiopeia. So they got star chart in this book as well. And so they're saying, look for the constellations and the star in the sky and then set up your string protractors, make do sextant over here. So um, again, we're talking, you gotta get a 90. So that's the observer's 90, is that string with the weight. And to get a 90, which is a right angle, see whenever you say, this is the funny part, especially early on, um, Adam was laughing, I'm sure. Uh, you, when they say 90, they're really saying right angle. They, right angle and 90 is the same thing. So when, when all the books, and that's what kept popping out of these books, you subtract from 90, you minus from 90. I go, that's a right angle. And the GP of the star has to be a radius direct to you from a circle of equal altitude, which is another thing in the book that they put. And I'm saying, well, if it's a 90, that's straight. That's all the way straight. And if you get three of them, and look, they even have the box there saying it's 90. And this is in their own books. And then you go next page and they lie to you about the globe. And then you go next page, they tell you the truth about sextant. And then the next page, they lie to you about something else. And so these ballers have to realize that they're being lied to at the same time, truth is being dripped on them. As you can see here, this is a right angle triangle up there and you need a 90. And it's obviously the Earth is flat. Anyway, you can go to, uh, I think I blew that one up so people could see it a little bit better. The next slide. Yeah, I've got it. It's a bit closer, better. Yeah, so they can see. And then see to the right, they're showing you the constellations and how to read it and, and know where you are and all that kind of stuff. Kind of give you a hint. Now, what was the only claim I ever made and still have made and not made anymore about the findings of the sextant? It's simply this. It's an instrument to measure angles. That's all it is. And it's a glorified protractor. And the second part is to find an angle. And the minute you define an angle, those two together destroy the globe. And those are the only two claims I make. So people say, well, you've never used the sextant. You haven't gone out to sea. You haven't done it. I go, well, first of all, I own a sextant, and I, I plan to do that, but I don't need to do it. I have hundreds of videos of watching guys do it. The point is the tool is limited, and the tool cannot do something with a curved adjacent. It is impossible. I, I used to say curved baseline. It can't work with a curved baseline, same thing. So the whole point is you can't take that tool and say it's working on the globe, but you can take that tool and say it can work with a baseline. The reason I like right. curved adjacent is because you're gonna be doing things with triangles. So if you just say baseline, that can mean more than one thing. As soon as you say adjacent, adjacent to the hypotenuse. So you're talking about specifically about the function on screen now, when you say curved adjacent, that means this baseline would be curved. Now, I know I'm using the word that tenth used in substitution, but obviously we've got a triangle on screen, so the hint isn't needed in the description when you're asking a concise and short housekeeping question. But, yeah, curved adjacent, I, 
I like that terminology because there's a very specific implication about what you're talking about when you ask that question. Yes, I agree. Uh, I even dribbled that in with some of the early shows in, in the pre-show, uh, showing how triangle worked. And so I too like the curved adjacent much better. So uh, go to the next slide. And right. so this one's la Latitude from Polaris from the survival book. And you can see they're taking a protractor and holding it and looking on the to Polaris, dropping the plumb bob to establish their triangle, their 90, um, and then reading off the angle off the sextant. And you can see lots of videos of this. People tape the straw, like a you know drinking straw, uh, you know sipping straw to the the flat part of the the protractor, and then uh, they hang a weight and they do the same thing. So it's nice survival techniques. And then uh, the next slide, uh, I kind of shows another way of doing it. They got the Weems plotter, which they use on the charts, and then uh, the same idea uh, with the protractor, with the weight, reading the angle. And then another way of, of doing your right angle triangle. So the stake, the top of the stake would be, say, the star or moon. And the bottom of the stake would be the GP of the moon. In this case, it's a stick. And then the stake to the left, that's smaller, that would uh, that would be where the observer is looking to get the angle. And obviously, you see the 90 there. And, and this is just to measure the angle. This doesn't give you zenith distance. It's to complement the other right angle triangle that's is above it, <laughs> the, the, you know, the sky miles. That has to be straight. So goodbye meridians that bend. There are no meridians that bend. Zenith distance proves meridians don't bend. And then the last slide is just a close-up of that same one, so. Steph. And thank you for giving us the book recommendations as well. Sure. Well, there'll be more when I finish that, because what I'm doing is taking a picture of each book, going through one or two, you know, things that I spotted in the book, uh, and then going to the next book, doing the same thing through all the books. There'll be a whole show. When's your interview with uh, Eli? Um, he hasn't contacted me. Um, we're working on good questions to ask me, and so I send him a list that he can... Uh, include or with the ones he wants to ask. So he asked me to help him is out he, there. So what's he doing? Is he broadcasting it, recording it and putting well, he's, it a, he's a he's a mod at 24-7 and and so he's just gonna have me on one time when he's a mod there. He's a senior mod, I guess, and he's just gonna interview me. Said how'd you get into it? Would you well, why'd you buy the books? You know, what did you see? You know, that kind of back and forth just to get the story. Cool. Just um, going back to the brainwashing thing we were talking about earlier. Um, Temp, I think I spoke to you the other day. I mentioned it. I've been watching a few videos and I, but, um, um, of demonstrations, professional people showing you how the sextant works, and they are doing the, the double speak of the globe and the angles. Now, I can honestly say, if I was into the flat earth and looking into this uh, as a normie, I probably just that would have skipped right plus my mind that globe um, and everything like that. It, 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 I'm only noticing these things jumping out on because I'm looking into it. Uh, yeah, that's right. You need the cipher. <laughs> Without the cipher, you're not going to get it. So you're going into these books uh, totally programmed to think you live on the sphere, begging the question. You, that's correct. You go to uh, any few flat earth debate shows get a little bit of a uh, counter to that and say, huh, I wonder if these people are onto something. Next time I look at a book that says I live on the ball, I'll put some of these housekeeping questions to test. So next time you look at the book, you see the pictures and you say, well, why do they have that tangent plane? 
Well, why do they? Well, how is that possible? If it's curving away from you, how do you get a right angle triangle? No, no, something's wrong here. And all of a sudden, because you're looking, because you have the cipher, you're, you're able to spot these things. Same goes I mean, for science. Friends, when people hear the word if, science, if, they don't necessarily twig that you're being led to believe there's empirical evidence for what's being claimed. You it's like a... I'm sorry. That's it. You just don't think about it. I'm oh, just okay. saying it's the same thing. Well, it's like sales. Uh, I, I used to go read contracts for people because they'd sign contracts thinking they got something and the contract said the opposite. So I, I, was, I said, get your contract. That's the legal document, right? They go, yeah, but we don't trust salesmen anymore. I said, I know. But contract is a contract. You do. You sign that it, it's yours. You have to oblige by it. They go, right. And we're mad. I said, fine. Let me show you how to spot a fake or, or something that's wrong. So they bring their contract out and they start reading. And I'd start going to the places I knew to go. And they say, oh, my gosh, that's not what the salesman told us. That's not what the, we were led to believe. That's not. So then they say, what can we do? And I said, well, well I can't recover all your loss, but you can stop losing. <laughs> and then they become my clients. And I'd read them my contract and show them that none of that stuff was in my contract. And they'd say, okay, we trust you. And then I'd get referrals and away I go. So it's the same thing here. Right. You don't know what you don't know, but if you're not looking, you're never going to find out. Seek, and you will find. Right. Ask, and it shall be given. Amen. Good voice, Nathan. Don't let that kill the conversation 60 seconds before the live show begins. It's supposed to be speaking the of 60 seconds. Speaking of 60 seconds, the base 60 system from the Babylonians is going to be in place soon. Okay. We're going from sextant to sexagesimal or gesmal, however you pronounce it. Very good. And soon I'm going to release the globe of my kitchen. <laughs> I thought you'd already done that by way of hand puppet. No, I'm, I'm actually going to uh, transpose the uh, coordinate system onto a ball. Oh, I see. Well, you said it's about Darwin's interest. He was discussing it on his live show today. Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you're currently watching, then click the link in the info box below at this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. 
Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel, so please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. One last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth debate. Now we are joined by 10th Man, Neil, the Adam Meakin, Arwin, Refracted Curvature and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome one and all. Hello, hello. Hello. Afternoon. 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 How are you? Are you doing, huh, Neil? Are you doing? Are you doing? Very good, friends. Impression of a uh, Yankee. Any evidence that you can acquire an elevation angle by way of a curved adjacent? Earth is flat. That's why we lead with this question, and there's total silence as a result. That's fair enough. It's going to take a while, even for our own side, to appreciate the power of this question. This proves Earth is flat. Both sides of the argument must accept the flatness, and if they have any preconceived notions of sphericity, they have to correct those to be flat in order to acquire an elevation angle. I was going to say, it's got nothing to do with the nature of the Earth, but what a load of geometric claptrap is to try and claim you can have a curved line to form an angle. Um, you can't. Rob, no, that's Rob Durham said. And not, not humans, even to the logic through a human, but to ask a computer, an unbiased computer, the computer says, no. No angle there to measure. Does not compute. That's why we lead with it. That's the proof. That's the proof we are standing on a flat plane. Obviously, observably, measurably, navigatably, flat plane that we must have and must be accepted by both sides, including any prerequisite that they must have a sphere beneath their feet corrected to be flat in order to measure any angle ever off the plane that we stand upon. The second question we ask is the 2020 black swan devastation, which is any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon, formerly known as Earth Curve. No, you're going to need R for that. And if they're going to bring their Earth curve, then that means they believe you can get an angle with a curved adjacent. So down one at number two, in terms of the top arguments we present here, the claim that we're on a sphere comes with a claim of a physical sphere edge. That's Earth curve. And that's your horizon if you believe you're on a sphere. And we've debunked that. The horizon is not Earth curve. You'll need R for that? Yeah, you'll need that physical geometric sphere edge formerly known as Earth Curve to derive R. And you can't. We've debunked it. So there is no R. Any evidence of the R value? Yeah, but they're not accepting it because if you look for globe proofs, that's the same one. Ships disappearing whole first over the horizon. So yeah, that's Earth Curve. We've debunked it. If the Earth was a sphere with a radius of 39.59 miles, that's the R value, then every distance to the horizon, that's the physical geometric limitation called Earth Curve, could be no more than 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height and feet. That's the Earth Curve mathematics. Distance to the horizon in the black swan image, as we have dubbed it, is beyond the limitations of a sphere Earth with a radius 39.59. The distance to the geometric physical sphere edge Earth Curve horizon would be 1.2 miles, as the observation's at one foot. And it's beyond 10 miles of observation, with the oil rig standing at just over nine and a half miles. So you've got a horizon that's beyond the limitations of a physical sphere edge called Earth Curve. We debunked it. We don't have Earth Curve for a horizon. There is no Earth Curve. Well, as far as R goes, you'd have to accept curvature um, to assert the Earth has a radius value, and then you would have to deny elevation angles exist as a consequence of that belief. Nice way to round it out when asking for R. If you're gonna claim you can get it or use it, you're gonna need a flat plane for it. Those angle measurements are gonna require that you take an elevation angle to make the claim that you can derive an R value. <laughs> well, that means you need a flat plane for that R value. 
Nathan, two, uh, sli two slides up and master me once Adam's done. I would just say that was the point of John's demonstration yesterday when he went to demonstrate the sphericity of his kitchen. He, he did start with the disclaimer first that all of these measurements that he's taken are taken from a flat planar surface for him to derive the angles to prove how curved that flat surface is. Um, that is one of the, is that the Brywinian paradox they're in there? Um, but that's, that's the reality of it. To take the angle, you need the flat surface first. And um, I mean, yesterday's tongue-in-cheek effort, I think, demonstrated that very well. What what they're doing, what they're doing in their mass and what they're reifying and what they're taking to reify the board. Yeah, the, they can't look to my uh, over-exaggerated version of it and say it's false without disclaiming their own model by proxy. I don't see how it's over-exaggerated. It's the same. I used a Muppet and acted silly. Oh, the, f the presentation, the formatting. Okay, yeah, I've got Okay, fine. And I compare that to Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he's not a Muppet with a silly voice. Yeah, but the maths is the same. The, the, yes. the presentation might be descended into dumbed-down fast to a degree, but ultimately what you're presenting is just their maths and their methodology to derive a spherical radius for your house. That's the same methodology doesn't matter what you're using, your justification for a physical obstruction at the wall rather than the horizon. Yeah, that, that, that could also argue be slightly ludicrous, but it doesn't matter. Well, why is it any less farcical to claim that a non-physical position and apparent location that we call the horizon is in any way a physical obstruction known as Earth curve? It's no more right or wrong or less farcical in that respect. So on the one hand, I can say, yeah, you claimed your wall was the limitation to your view, and it was. So in many ways, you were saying it's less farcical, and I could also go that way. But yeah, it, okay, we've descended it into fast to, a, an, to an extent, but the maths that's being used and the methodology that's being used to derive refracted curvature, that's John, and a spherical value for his house based on angle measurements off a flat plane, that's the point we're trying to make here. It's the first housekeeping question to then give him the trig he needs, to, to the angles he needs, to derive an R value from his flat plane. And then next thing you know, you've got houses with garages that are supposed to have the car 90 degrees positionally to you in your basement antipode and you hanging off the ceiling when you go down the stairs and all sorts of other crazy nonsense because suddenly the area that's actually flat that he's actually contending with and actually measured to claim all this is now being claimed to be spherical. Same as the Earth. Exactly the same. Hey, John, what was the radius of your kitchen anyway? Uh, 85 inches. <laughs> let's, just go, <laughs> let's just go to the first slide. I've had it up for a little while, 10th. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so here's the first slide. I just want you to read the bottom left. Dip correction is eye level with the C, and it shows the dotted line. Go up to the top. You see the sun somewhere off in the distance. It's got a zenith distance directly over the earth somewhere. That line is not drawn, but Nathan, if you take your cursor and bring it straight down, it should hit the T and the two, parallel to actual horizon. And that is it. That is exactly what's happening. So they are ignoring their geometric horizon that doesn't exist and only exists in the maths. It's a thought experiment. Actual horizon is the dotted line. If height of I is zero minutes, zero seconds, dip correction is I level with the C. This other line below the dotted line that you see horizon written on, they even throw that under the bus in this picture. They're not using it. That's not dip correction. Next slide. It shows dip correction using the natural horizon is needed to become a true right angle. So of course, you're going to have to take it as if your eyeballs were at the sea level when you took it. So you just deduct the height above the sea level to get your right angle. The artificial horizon already gets it to your eye line because it establishes a horizontal by shooting the sun twice and you 
got a half the uh, the reading. So if it says 80 degrees, it's really 40. But right there, that validates it, that on land, you can have the sextant work for you, but you've got to get a true horizontal. And at C, prior to dip, you don't have a true horizontal. You're a little bit above, so you got to bring it down. It's not that hard, ballers. The next one. Well, here it is. That's what you're trying to establish at sea on the boat, at to your eye line. But it's very difficult unless that blue line, ground level, is parallel. And so that's why you do dips. So the ground level, the sea level, which gives you your eye line horizontal, it's a parallel. It's the same thing with the artificial horizon and the bubble section. Excellent, very good. Bit more housekeeping. Any evidence of a self perpetuating molten iron core at the center of a presupposed spherical earth? I was about the same amount of evidence for that as there is uh, to the center of my presupposed spherical kitchen. Therefore, well, molten, what's therefore, iron, therefore, generating magnetic fields beyond Curie points. Is that what you're saying? Obviously, because you've derived a spherical value, it must have a molten iron core. Well, I'm just saying there's about as much evidence for their molten iron core as there is for the molten iron core at the center of my kitchen sphere. If we ignore the standard of what would be evidence, that would be proof, then well, what none, right? But we've got what people think is evidence, cartoon imagery and stories about it. Which I'm sure What's you can produce at a pinch, right, John? You could scribble up a few pictures of the core at the centre of your presupposed spherical domain. Well, that is why I was thinking of creating a, a ball and transposing my uh, coordinate systems of my kitchen onto that ball. So that I can then cut it in half and describe to you what's happening inside that ball. I mean, if you could produce that depictorially, I'd appreciate it for a thumbnail, for sure. Now go to work. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Hold on. There's still something about that because what's gaining traction now with these anti flat earthers and ballers is that tsunami caused by the volcanoes erupting. It came up again yesterday on QE show. They were trying to say that the way they measured it, where the volcanoes, where the tsunamis were happening, it can only happen on a ball. Because? Adam knows more about it. Adam, you were breaking it down yesterday. Are you there? Yeah. Well, I was exposed to it yesterday. Betty was saying a few bits, but my only point was that they seem to be making the, the proof that it's spherical is that the timings of the tsunami wave match their ball distances, but it doesn't match the straw man that they build for the flat earth model. Therefore, it must be a ball. But again, it's timings. Timings doesn't seem to have anything to do with nature. Uh, orientation it's literally just the timing of a tsunami wave but I said that that seems to be the crux of their argument that the timings the distances seem to match um, a bit like transatlantic flights Pacific flights let's get a quick question then Adam when you say they match do they match with a ball model that was derived by a flat plane elevation angle measurement in the first instance yeah I mean so they're claiming a flat earth proof then Pretty much in a way, isn't it? But to me, there's no, there's no, there's no claim there. All you're saying is it it took this long. Um, but your your point of argument that you've got against the flat earther is, but on your model, which they built kindly built for us, um, it doesn't match. Well, that's that's just a complete straw man, isn't it? All you've done is say on your azimuth or projection of a ball those distances are longer and the wave would have took longer to reach that point on, on the on my straw man 
of a ball. Uh, it's got to, we've got to get these disclaimers in. A, I know it's going to be adding to the mouthful of words that has to come out without getting an interruption from me. But I apologise in advance. From a ball. So the azimuth equidistant projection of a ball that was made with elevation angle measurements off a flat plane. Correct? Yeah. Just to get that clear, yeah. as Brian's He's just joined. Longer, I wouldn't, isn't it? <laughs> I, well, well, I wouldn't want Brian to tell me off. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, well, you know that uh, the ballers, considering it's a tsunami, will just hand wave the Smiths. <laughs> okay, can I, just, can I just point something out about Brian as he's just joined, right? So o over the last week, I've been in and out of hospital with a head injury. Not that many people would particularly know that or it matters not. Other than during that time, having had a concussion and prolonged period of pain, I got back home, I watch, start watching a video that I can hardly hear because my ears are full of blood. And I leave a comment about it, just a, just a minor point about a video I happen to watch in one of the chat feeds, right, that I don't normally interact with, but obviously I'm ill and I'm just sat there in pain. And what I got back from Brian was, yeah, I know you've banged your head right, but if you present this shit here, right, I won't <laughs> fucking tolerate it. That's what I got from Brian. That was the level of sympathy I got from Brian. Don't post Way shit go, here. Brian. You will experience more pain. That's what I got from Brian. Yeah, I well, I I didn't want to be unsympathetic, but I had to say something. <laughs> yeah, you weren't having it. <laughs> there was no excuses, and you took them away before <laughs> telling me off. Don't care what the excuses. Don't care how hard you banged your head. Post shit here. Expect pain. Was the impression <laughs> yeah. I got. Anywho, good to have you, Brian. Thanks, Aiden. I'm going to be on mute because I'm driving and I'm going into a bank and a hospital and all this sort of stuff. So I'm just going to have to listen in for the next hour. Uh, fair enough. I'll try and come in when I can, OK? Thank you. So we got to scientific evidence of gravity, but then backtracked to the prior question. So is there any? I'll take that as a note. Yes. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? We're still waiting. It's not impossible, but it's probably going to involve R. It won't be a viable hypothesis in that case. No. What about any evidence that you can have gas pressure without a container? With John's kitchen, he put an end to that and pointed out he did have containment with the roof. So, no, pressure requires containment. I, I didn't think I'd have to do this, but I was actually talking about the more wider Western world belief that the sky is a vacuum, not necessarily John's example of a spherical house domain with a contained gas. No. I'm, I'm, I'm a fully converted into ball kitchen, yeah? I've seen the maths, it's therefore true. Maths is reality, so therefore John's <laughs> house is spherical, right? No. Yeah. He showed me the numbers. I was, show, I was actually showing the numbers by a unicorn, so it's got to be true. Yes, that's right. The unicorn made a presentation. That doesn't add or subtract from the mathematical value, which is zero, in terms of proving that his house actually does exist in a spherical capacity. It doesn't. And he had to derive it from flat angle measurements in the first place, like with the globe Earth. Obviously, that being the more wider-reaching Western worldview, Adam. I mean, obviously, we know the kitchen floor is flat, so that it has to be, so we can take the angles to prove how much curves in it. You hear that, well, Bundy's? Can you repeat that, Adam? At least we know the kitchen floor is flat. It has to be so that we can obtain the angle so we can prove how curved it is. Unlucky for yeah, these. Yeah. Go on, tenth. Yeah, well, at least John showed us the wall, the geometric horizon that the ballers can't show us. Yeah. We are literally going to hang on this 
rather than the Western worldview that the Earth is a sphere with a sky vacuum in violation of the second law of thermodynamics and a physical geometric sphere edge for a horizon based on begging the question, proof of nothing, perspective hijacking, Earth curve maths. We, we're going to focus on John's spherical kitchen, right? Okay? Yeah, absolutely, because it is a perfect way of sharing the information is using another subject, another place, another thing. And so when you take what they say reality is, and you use the same math, the same logic that they think is logic, and apply it to John's kitchen, voila, why should they knock it? It's We're just using their words the way they get arrived to it. We just use John's you know, kitchen to show the absurdity of it all. Absolutely agree. It just takes me to be in slight defiance for that to be detailed, and then it would be you know, a home run for the audience. John, John's kitchen it appears as a, as a model. It appears less problematic. We just covered the gas pressure one, and he's, he's got an answer straight away. None of this gravity nonsense. He confirms with physics. Yep, I've got a roof on that thing. That's right. Yeah. And if you're hungry for information, it's the right place to be. And for fear of people claiming that this direct analogy to what was just said a moment ago being made in the comment section there's a roof on us also by comparison we can't have gas pressure without containment so no more two container demonstrations on our horizon <laughs> i can add one oh add, th add third container or add an extra example Add an extra example, but it also has containers. But in some way, the ballers think it demonstrates no containment. Let's They've been it. talking about how ionized gases can be held in a in this chamber, whereby they create a magnetic field, and then there's oh, no oh, direct. Oh, 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 let him say it. Let him say it. The this gas. might be new to the but audience, yet. Adam. Go ahead, fire <laughs> solar. <laughs> just trying to say it is making me laugh but they claim that by creating a magnetic field you can contain gases ionized gases and that's a perfect demonstration of the air which we breathe being con being not requiring containment i see go ahead adam so they put these ionized gases in a watt before they're going to contain them with a in a, in a container, basically. You don't have to answer that. It's not a fair question, Adam's yes. answering, asking. Totally unreasonable that you should ask but that, once, Adam. How dare you? But once it's actually turned on, then it's contained inside of the container, and it's not the walls of the container containing it. So therefore... Did they, did they know, take the walls the away lab. to prove that? Or did they keep no, it but, in the container and say, yeah, it's contained within the container? In its own containment. Look, inside yeah. the container, you've got gas pressure without a container. What's your problem? Exactly. Well summarised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, righty then. Yes, that, that was also quite amusing when it first came up. Because the people punting it. What I like about these sorts of claims, because that's a good couple of years old, maybe more. As, lo as old as the gas pressure without a container argument, at least. When it was first put to us, the flaw, the fatal flaw in the argument hadn't been spotted by the people who punted it, which is... Uh, yesterday we were saying, oh, we shouldn't laugh at these people, their pain is not amusing. But there are things that happen when people are experiencing cognitive dissonance that are very amusing, and that was one of them. Yeah, so let, let me hear it one more time. You take a container and you create gas pressure without a container in the container. You don't see the problem in this. No, there's gas pressure without a container in the container. <laughs> Another problem. Go on. The other problem, it's a false equivalence fallacy because we're asking how can you have gas pressure without a container, not how you can have plasma pressure without a container. It's two different states of matter. If I call it ionized gas, what was the term used again? Plasma. Was it actually just plasma? That wasn't the words that was used by uh, Flat Earth Solar. It was ionized gas. That, there you go. That's got the word gas in it. Bring it back. Yeah, proven 
the the contained gas inside of the container that's demonstrating no containment required. That's not gas pressure without a container. Plus, you got a container, like they said. That's a false equivalence. Ionized gas is plasma. That's a different state of matter. False equivalence. What about liquidized gas? <laughs> liquidized gas, huh? That's a good one. What about LPG, gas, man? Gas, What's gas. your problem? LPG. It's my problem. It's married bachelor. It's the problem. What about if I take the gas and I squash it really, really close together so it behaves a bit like liquid? <laughs> it behaves like liquid or is it a liquid? What are the four states of matter? Well, there's a couple more. We'll just deal with four. Solid. Then they like liquid. to use the word fluid instead of liquid. So yeah, it's yeah, not a state of matter. Dynamic. Yeah, thanks. That's if not a state of matter. John, if, if something's behaving like a liquid, um, wouldn't then be behaving like a gas at the same time, would it? Um, if it was under immense pressure, it started to exhibit liquid behavior. By definition, it would stop exhibiting gas behavior. Yeah, but the gas is experiencing liquid-like behavior. Focus on the gas bit, because that's the bit no, that no, might no. weasel us an answer if I'm a fundy with a globe belief. What's your problem? Well, now, changing pressure can also change the temperature at which a phase change will be induced, too. So there's that to discuss within it, isn't there? The question is, can you have gas pressure without a container? No, you can't. Thank you. But if we have two containers, then I can show you gas pressure without a container. All right, we're going to classify this as the infinite container fallacy. <laughs> <laughs> The Russian nesting doll fallacy. Yep. If you can take it far enough away from the original containment that's required to make your example, that it can almost seem like you can have gas pressure without a container. Kind of a bit like talking about deltas of gas pressure that's already got containment in order to be achieved. You can talk about the gas pressure gradient after the gradient has been formed because you've got containment to form it. Just ignore the containment required to form it bit and focus on the delta of the claim in the first instance that you've got a sky vacuum which you would be to say that we've got gas pressure that we're all breathing without containment for it ludicrous violation of natural law we got flat earth that would also be a now. red herring fallacy what's a red herring fallacy uh as soon as they go to <clears throat> excuse me as soon as they move the gas pressure gradients that's a red herring fallacy to the question indeed yeah. Do you remember how Professor Phil solved the problem? Why, no. by bashing his face in with a spade shovel? Well, sure. <laughs> he basically said it's a gradient vacuum all the way to the edge of the universe, which is the That's second law of thermodynamics violation. <laughs> he doesn't know where the edge of the universe is. A gradient vacuum. That sounds like a married bachelor, too. A gradient vacuum. Yeah, it's, it's just, a new product from Dyson. No, let's just redefine <laughs> what a vacuum is, right? That's what it is. Yeah, that's you got it. That's also Xanax claim that there's actually a vacuum here on the surface, and it's just radiated at different levels as you. Well, get that's higher. probably it's down a to a partial vacuum. That's probably down to a NASA claim. I've, I'm sure I've read somewhere in terms of NASA's terminology that the edge of space does actually begin at ground level. Correct. According so you're actually standing according... in the vacuum of space yeah, at the moment. Level. Yeah. And then there's varying degrees of vacuum moving up. So that's in line with heliocentrism, actually, as, as farcical as it sounds. Well, according to some flat earthers, there's no pressure here at all. <laughs> Let's not worry about those idiots. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Are you going to use elevation angles to assert a distance? I'm not. Then no. No, we, we don't really have anything. But that's a good point. I mean, there's a lot of stuff being used with angles to these celestial objects. So, come on. Someone's got to step up and give us a distance to it. Because I say so, obviously that means that we've got to. 
because that's how it works. Well, the people say 93 million miles away. Um, heliocentrists say 93 million miles away. Yeah, that includes it's... a contradiction, though. The angle measurement's taken off a flat plane to derive an R value, and that R value that's derived from the flat plane is inserted into the calculation to give you the distance at 93 million miles. So based on a spherical R value that's derived from a flat plane, and then when you're going to verify it well off the ground by angle measurement, well, that's a flat plane measurement also. So that has a contradiction in it. No, not 93 million miles. You'll need R, and R will be derived from a flat plane. Self-defeating. Because it's an apparent position, it would only seem sensible to use an apparent distance and an apparent unit. So the only number I'd put on it is three Arwinian units. An Arwinian unit, by the way, is the distance to a rainbow. Or is it a moon? Oh, God, I'm always and getting what, this wrong. And what's the distance to a rainbow or the moon? There is no... Uh, one, uh, there's an answer to that. One third the distance to the sun, if I'm correct, in one Arwinian unit being the distance to a rainbow, and three Arwinian units being the distance to the sun. I believe two Arwinian units is the distance to the moon. So it's one third the distance to the sun. Half the distance to the moon. There you go. What's wrong with that? Well, as, as Chocolate would say, that checks out. Yeah, it does check out. Go then. And since you're not the one saying it, you're citing someone else. It has to be true. And if it's not, then that's not my problem. I can immediately defer my defeat to the person I cited because that's perfectly reasonable. And he's probably shopping right now, so we don't even know. Exactly. He doesn't know how big a problem I'm developing for him, you citing <laughs> him like this. <laughs> I want to know what the distance to the sun in John's kitchen is. Sun? You mean lighting fixture? Yes, whatever his sun is. What's the distance? I just Maybe want to know how we can it worship out that it. Way. I want to know how we can I put was... that lighting fixture at the center of our life and bow down to it and worship it, my friend. I don't know about distance. Worship is much higher on my priority list. Well, we have NASA fanboys. Now we got John fanboys. The lighting fixtures in my kitchen are assumed to be infinitely distant. <laughs> it's the only way to resolve the mathematics, you see. True. Otherwise, it gets too complicated. And that's only an assumption. It's not unreasonable to just make that assumption. Because in both models, it's a known fact that all of these things have accepted positions. Um, to use the accepted positions would create a problem that the model didn't work. And therefore, we ignore that and we put everything to infinity in both ball and kitchen model. I'm glad you clarified it as ball and kitchen model. They're essentially the same thing. They've just got, you know, slightly different parameters for the original measurements to give yeah. you distances and radii. So they're different the in that respect, the but the maths and the derivations are the same. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember when at the beginning of this conversation, people started triangulating the sun and coming out with a distance of 3000 miles and then flat earthers were all claiming the sun is 3000 miles away. Yeah. That was given to us. Hold on. Are you there? Oh, Brian's driving, isn't he? There's a big problem with that in terms of if you ignore perspective and back away from something, the distance is going to change, isn't it? Till you get to zero, with it above you. Good point. But wouldn't that change the elevation angle accordingly and that you'd still get a 3,000 mile distance? It doesn't yeah, only change. If you're using Two that, points of triangulation, because once you add multiple points, we start getting the sun in apparently different locations. Well, I can't explain Hello? why. I can explain what. And what occurs in terms of the position of a given star above a given location, that is it's seemingly set in stone and very, very predictable. Now, as a consequence of where the star is going to lie at 90 degrees to a person below it on the ground or depending on where it is, and you're measuring it with triangulation, it could be above the sea just to give you your positional data. But we'll take it as read that in this example, there's someone actually stood below it on the ground when you look at it from your position out at sea for the sake of argument. Well, that predictability in terms of where it will be above means that you can map it out with a two-for-one special in terms of the angle versus the number of miles from your position to that position where the star is above. 
Now that's very useful. Does it mean that I can derive the height? No. Does it mean that that can be put to practical application? Absolutely, and is. Yeah, you're just utilizing the angle and the ground measurement. You don't, you don't know the actual height. No, but I do know it's above a particular location on the ground at a given time. And that seems to always work as a result of people having a good uh, uh, base knowledge of what, what the stars do and how they move and where they will be at a given time over what piece of land. And lo and behold, if you were to check and look up, yeah, that star's directly above me. Are you asserting that the sun is a star? Well, I wasn't thinking of a star in that example, but if you want to, it doesn't matter what you define it as. I don't care what you think or anyone thinks the sun is. I don't know. So therefore, if you say it's the same, but larger as the things that appear in the night, I can give you a whole list of things that make it fundamentally different. Doesn't mean it's not. I don't know. I'd argue just as much for someone saying that it isn't a star. That's what I'm trying to get at. Because I don't know, and I know that the person claiming it's not going to have a, just a bigger job as proving it one way or the other when they claim it. Saying it isn't, it's like, well, anything's possible. You haven't disproven that. I don't know that that isn't the case, because I don't know what it is. So how am I supposed to know what it isn't? It's just as equally unknown. Mm. Well, now you can know that it's not a ball of gas in a vacuum. That would be a violation of yes, I can. Law. I can list a whole bunch of things that I know it isn't just by virtue of knowing that it isn't a bloody unicorn or whatever. Yeah. Okay. We already proved that it could be a ball of gas. Might be. Yeah, in a Stands glass in... tachymac reactor that's above the surface. But but that description comes from a heliocentric world with a sky vacuum, which puts that claim in violation of the second law of thermodynamics. No, it's not a burning ball of gas in a sky vacuum. That violates natural law, and that's where that or that originates from. Now, okay, you could say, well, they're just looking at it and measuring the light. Therefore, spectroscopy is hinting at what it might be. Doesn't necessarily put it in a sky vacuum. It's like, well, okay, maybe I can lend some credence to it. And then you rip apart the notion of having any sort of control over looking through a whole load of whatever you may or may not appreciate. If you're claiming it's a vacuum but you don't know, then you don't know what you're measuring through and therefore the claims are all bunk like they would be in a in a heliocentric world anyway. So you go, well, back to we not knowing anything about it really. Having a little guess with spectroscopy seems like a very blunt tool to make any claims about this item in the sky. Yeah, let, let's be clear. What Nathan elucidated there is that you need validation of the media between point A and point B in order to make assumptions about the way light's traveling between you and it and what it's doing. Yeah, and what we've got to go on is a lie. Sky vacuum is what is claimed. Now, if you take that information and just bastardize a bit out for reasons of affirmation bias, confirmation bias for some bullshit that you've made up about what you think the sun is, then I'll just, I'll just argue against that in line or not in line with heliocentric wor worldviews. It doesn't matter. We don't know. So we don't know what's between us and it because we've been lied to about the sky. It's not a vacuum. And that's where that claim lies. It is handy, though, for a globe earther when you make a claim that you know, because then they can hold their model up in false dichotomy with your claim. If I made one, which I don't, you know what I no, always no, no, found? No, hey, enter Arwin. Go ahead, Arwin. Yeah, okay. What I always found really interesting and funny and kind of bizarre about the whole heliocentric conception about the stars is that, yeah, the, the inverse square law applies, so it should be brighter as you approach it. Yet all these stars at all these insane different levels of distance away uh, sized up by astronomists, right? To be out there yet all the light that reaches us from all these various distances seem to be roughly equal how does that make any intuitive sense right it's like all the light reaching us from all these extreme and slightly less extreme distances are all roughly equal like what 
How, how do you why, even justify that in your mind as a heliocentrist? That's why they call it, yeah, Arwen, that's why they call it Olber's Paradox. Who's? Olber, O-L-B-E-R's Paradox. Olber's Paradox. Okay, lay this out for us. Okay, if all your light is coming in parallel from the stars that are infinitely, quote-unquote, placed around the universe, it should be daylight 100% of the time. Oh, right. Yes. If it if the stars were as big and bright as claimed, then everything should be one daylight continually everywhere. OK, yeah. but that's not what you claimed, is it? No, it isn't. No, but he's still but... saying that that's the, one of the paradoxes of the heliocentric system. Arwen's saying it's a paradox because if you've got them all at different distances and different intensities, then that's what they should appear like. And they don't. They all roughly appear the same. Now, you can. Right. Look at them in closer detail and say, well, no, there's actually stark differences between them all. But to the average untrained naked eye, they all look about the same, is what Arwen's saying. Well, look, yeah, but the amount of luminosity difference isn't all that staggering, right? There's not like, oh, it my is. God, that's that star it's again. It's like, ah, oh, like a needle in my eye. It's so bright. And the rest, like, I can barely see it. No, it's roughly from an intensity from one to four. And that's it. There's no extremities, and there should be a lot of them. Why do they accept paradoxes? That's my question. Because the heliocentric model is fake. But but wakey, they, wakey, do all in, that. they do adjust distances based on luminosity. So they do say this one looks less bright, so it is further, and this one looks more bright, so therefore it's larger. So they've got either a size um, transformation or a distance transformation to justify those variations in the starlight. So they yeah, but they assign that it. arbitrarily either bigger or farther away, but it still doesn't make any sense. Within the model. All of that would reach us at roughly equal level with all these insane astronomical distances in this inverse square law of light. It's insane. When you point out an issue, it's... so when Wakey Wakey highlighted an issue to an astrophysicist, her reaction was, well, then that needs changing within the model. In other words, there's an easy flip of a switch between what is representative or descriptive of physical reality versus how it works within the model. These uh, higher-ups within the heliocentric hierarchy can very easily switch between those two different positions at the drop of a hat. And when one is incorrect, doesn't work, shown to be wrong, they can just say, well, that needs to be corrected within the model then, doesn't it? In other words, there's a, a big disconnect that can be implied at any stage, should anything not quite jive in the model. It's like, oh, okay, I understand that it's a model now that it's not working and not representative for physical reality. But obviously the rest of the time and everything else that's not broken and does work is representative for physical reality. Right, yeah, they don't, don't they don't face paradoxes like it's a catastro like it's a a, a catastrophe. Something to figure out. Yeah, just something to work out. There's a problem within right, the exactly. model description. Exactly. When a paradox is always assigned like a uh, syntax error, syntax error, the entire thing is completely screwed. That's the alarms that should be going off when they find a paradox. When Michio Kaku's describing some paradox within dark matter and the mathematics thereof he's joking and laughing about it it's all very amusing how far they off in science that would be pseudoscience bullshit story time but how far they off wow it's amazing we're off to this massive factor it's like he's not worried about it is he it's like almost amusing to him isn't a paradox basically a contradiction and doesn't that break the law of non-contradiction Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, married bachelor. Oops. The two the two cannot be so they, in existence. It's not a possibility to have that. You can't have a married so bachelor. But when a married bachelor appears in the heliocentric model, it's, wow, isn't this an amusing paradox we can talk about in terms of how our world being sphere-shaped in a vacuum doesn't work? Isn't that interesting? And everyone goes, yeah, wow. <laughs> isn't that interesting? <laughs> So they just put a fancy word on contradiction so they can actually accept the contradiction. 
Yeah, call it they a paradox. Use the, they use the paradox to be philosophically edgy sounding. Yep, that's right, are we? The paradox only works if everyone accepts the premise. But the premise has been uh, falsified, so it's now yes. just a contradiction within their model. Yes. A contradiction within a model is very different to a paradox. A paradox would imply that this is something that doesn't work in, in physical reality but still exists and still is part of a physical reality that you understand to be the case. Now, if you show that the premise that's been accepted, i.e. you accept that there's a heliocentric model with a sky vacuum, and then within that model description that you've reified, something doesn't work, if you take that person out of that acceptance in the first instance, that would be heliocentric model in a vacuum, then there's no longer a paradox about the sun being a burning ball of gas in a second law of thermodynamics violation. That is no longer a paradox. It's just a contradiction in a model description of a world we don't actually stand on. Good summary, John. It was you that did that originally and pointed out, I think it was on a show I actually labelled as paradoxes and something else, but you, you pointed out that a lot of these paradoxes are now solved. Why? Well, because to meet the definition of paradox, there's got to be an underlying premise that's accepted. If you undermine the premise that must be accepted, it, it takes away any validity to the paradox. There isn't a paradox anymore because the premise is flawed. The premise isn't real, so therefore this can't stand in contradiction in physical reality to it as a paradox, because the flaw has been displayed in the premise we now no longer accept. Yeah, it's a, um, it is one way to solve a paradox, I guess. Yeah, undermine the premise it's based on, rather than trying to figure out how to make the one work and jive within the model. You say, well... We, the model isn't real <laughs> we're not standing on a sphere in a vacuum so it doesn't really matter about us not having gas pressure without a container you know obviously natural law still applies we must be contained what's that you you still want to believe in rockets and spacemen oh isn't that nice well, well they'd rather just break apart the very foundations of physical existence by saying that second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply to the earth Right? If they're okay with paradoxes, then why not just deny the fundamental laws of physical reality? Absolutely. If need be, you can invent, invent a whole new dimension, if need be. You know, fourth dimension, pfft, not a problem. You're all denying the video evidence of rockets. No. No. I've seen no. rockets. Rockets are cool. Burning gases going yeah. up into the sky, cool. However, they don't travel to an area that violates natural law claimed to be a vacuum. Yes, they did. It shows it on the video. Hey, John, is there <laughs> rockets in your kitchen? How can you John, show... Hold on. Hold on. Niels just said it shows. I said you can't have this video claimed to be in a natural law violation, and Neil's response was it shows it in the video. You're telling me they show gas pressure without a container in the video? No, I'm looking for the rocket launch where they said it shows you the whole thing going into space and everything. Oh, okay, they're, you're... they're never going to show you them going through the wardrobe and the actual transitional stage akin to the TARDIS when it shows it going through all those wibbly-wobbly colours. Yeah, as it's travelling to a different timeline or whatever it is claimed by the TARDIS to be shown in that particular sequence, right? You want to see the sequence of going to a place that doesn't exist, like going to Narnia or going through time in the TARDIS. Well... They can claim to show you that, but the place they're going to fundamentally isn't real. They're not going there. So to say I need to see an unedited footage of them going into Narnia or space, the sky vacuum, no, no, <laughs> they're not doing that. The other day we didn't labour it enough when Tenth was like, what do you mean they're claiming this, this entity in a sky vacuum called the ISS a light in the sky that we experience that will be replaced with another claim to be entity in a sky vacuum regardless of what they claim to be the end of the life cycle for the current justification for that light that's the ISS it's in a pool it's not hurtling around a sphere earth in a sky vacuum that's nonsense it's just a little story that they put up on tv to justify this light that we can see oh well, they say they have unedited video of it Hang on, hang on. John, can you have unedited video of shooting a rocket in your kitchen? Well, that's what I was about to say. They're, what they're doing is they're assuming uh, the black bit that they see above them is uh, 
you know, they're doing the same thing they always do. They're just assuming that that's a vacuum. And then because something is filming <laughs> that, that black bit, therefore they went into a vacuum. No, no, no. In your model of a sphere house domain, you said that the distance to the light fixture was assumed to be infinite. Well, obviously, if you've got that reified into physical existence, there's a very long journey, potentially, between you and that lighting fixture, isn't there? With it assumed to be infinite. Therefore, can we have a launch video, unedited, from you to the presupposed infinite distance to that lighting fixture? Now, that's a very long journey that you could potentially broadcast with a transition from your gas pressure into your also gas pressure. It doesn't matter that you haven't got a vacuum. You do have an infinite distance to it, don't you? So that's a journey you could be well, showing us without edits, isn't it, John? Well, yes, but hold on a second. I just understood yesterday that my kitchen was a sphere. So I, it's, I need a little time before I can start journeying into the, the uh, sky. <laughs> that's all right. I could give you that time as an extra dimension. I mean, what more do you need? John, it's time to get out of the kitchen. Have you got an extractor? Is that a geodesic oh. statement, Tef Look, Don't complicate things with extractor fans. Tef man knows about kitchens. John, it's time to get out of the kitchen. You got to wait for John, the JFK did... speech. John, did you get your kitchen from uh, iSphere? I, I mean, IKEA. Okay, so for some reason, the, the Discord kicked off because we've started talking about your kitchen. That's yeah, that's we, Ikea, we, not Ikea. We we gotta wait for the JFK. If you hate speech, speech. then just don't talk. We we gotta wait for the JFK speech. We gonna make it to the to the ceiling fan. We're gonna Back. make it to the moon. Perfect. Yes. Oh, uh, I'm gonna get Neil to do it. <laughs> no, I need somebody from Massachusetts. I could do a Boston accent. Just oh, look yeah. under the carpet. Yeah, because yeah, we'll be launching the from the carpet, and the blood that spilled, we will conquer the moon. What does he say? That's a pretty Not good Kennedy. It's easy. Don't Not ask it's what easy. your country could do for you, but what you can do for your country. That speech made no sense. We're going to do it because it's hard. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that seems very stupid. You're just going to do it because it's really for. difficult. Okay, that doesn't seem like no, a good excuse for the challenge to do it. Of it. It's also hard to drive a nail into your own eyeball. Yeah, that's really difficult. Why didn't he do that? That's much harder. Because Maybe it's been done the before. He was talking about. Yeah, but he's not going to drive a nail into his eyeball socket because it's easy. You know, he's going to do it because it's specifically hard to do, right? Because that's a justification for doing things, isn't it? Yeah, but people have done that before. I'm going to push this car by ever hand. Fake the moon landing before, Nathan. I'm going to push really this car to... uphill by hand, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Listen, what's, Joe Rogan the... believes it. Joe Rogan believes it, so it's law. They what's went so to the moon. What's so hard about a swimming pool? Nobody's ever given Nathan a million dollar super chat before, and that's not easy. So somebody okay. needs to do that. It's hard. They need, they I don't think do that's because... possible. I don't think lit. I don't think that literally Google allows that number to be that high. <laughs> Nathan, I took pictures of the second book. If, if Master B, if you want to use that to round out. Okay, so I've got an introduction to nautical science. Yeah, this is the one I quoted, and it finally came in. So um, I call Chase. If we go to the first uh, page there under the chapter 13, the sextant, um, the modern sextant will just go, well, let's just go to the second thing. Uh, the sextant is an optical instrument which measures the angle formed between two visible points and the observer's eye. So, I mean, we all know that. It is generally capable of accuracy to a tenth of a minute. Celestial navigation, the angle we will measure with the sextant is the angle of elevation. So there's that angle of elevation that 
cannot work with a curved adjacent, obviously. So um, let's see, of the celestial body, we are using as a reference point above the horizon. We call this angle the altitude of the body and sometimes refer to it as height of body above the horizon. It is always expressed in degrees, minutes, and tenths of a minute. The modern sextant is descended from early angle measuring tools, such as the astrolabe and cross staff. The astrolabe actually measured the zenith distance of a body directly since it used gravity, the vertical, like a plumb bob, as its reference instead of the horizon. It's hard to imagine being able to use it on the deck of a rolling ship. However, and in any case for either of these instruments, accuracy to within a whole degree would have been difficult. The deck of a rolling ship still is a challenge to the navigator. But with low practice, accurate measurements can be made fairly easy with the modern sextant. Go to the next page. So this one, as it talks about index correction, if it's on the arc, it's off. If it's off the arc, it's on. You make that index correction in advance. If we read what it says, which means that if the error is forward on the arc, then it must be subtracted from the angle measured by the sextant and vice versa. This is the first correction made to height sextant. The next thing we must account for is the fact that the horizon we see is not really 90 degrees from our zenith or from vertical, unless our eye is right at sea level. At sea level, the horizon is tangent to the sea surface and at right angles to the vertical. Remember, they said, don't say 90, don't say right angle. Remember all that? <laughs> this is out of their own books. But as our height of eye gets higher, the visible horizon dips lower and lower. The higher our eye, the bigger the amount of this dip angle. Dip is purely a function of our height of eye. So that height is known, dip can be calculated. There's a table inside of the front cover of the Nautical Almanac that provides this. Next, last page here. So as, as we read here, of these three sources of error, one is constant, the other two are inversely related to apparent altitude. This allows for all three to be lumped together into a single table found inside the front cover almanac called the altitude correction table for the sun. The table is entered first at appropriate month, then for the apparent altitude. And the total correction is taken from the upper limb or lower limb column, depending on which way the sun was observed. The correction is a number of minutes of angle and is added to or subtracted from the apparent altitude. The result of this is now the true altitude of the sun, called the height observed, or HO. This corrected altitude of the sun above the horizon, listen in, Bob, if subtracted from 90, right angle, boys, would give us an exact zenith distance of the sun at the moment we took the site. We will use this height observed in calculating a line of position. Thank you very much for including it in all your books. The Earth is flat. With that, I'm going to say, if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley programming streams, then stay tuned, as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. So a huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you. Smash the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, joined as an Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member, smash the PayPal link and all that good stuff. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. And this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on either Promo Streams. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video.
Say that though, at some level you have to cognitively uh, accept that it there's something wrong. You know? Well, when does a person there's give plenty in? wrong out there? You know, when so it's person, really easy to do that. When does a when the when does morning, a person? Guys. Hey, chocolate. When does hey, a chocolate. person? I'll get it out there soon. Eventually. Go on, go on, tenth. When, go Hello, tenth man. Hi, I'm, I'm trying. Not interrupting I'm you. trying. Okay. Ahead, I'm tenth. not stalling you or anything. That's so much refraction. One more time, in all right seriousness, now. everyone yeah, just lends. Total it. refraction here. Okay. At some point in a debate on any subject, not just this, but any subject, the evidence clearly shows one side the winner over the other. And so, when does a person? allow the evidence to be what makes their decision rather than what they want to believe so bad that it debunks, which it doesn't, but in their mind, it debunks any evidence anyone could show them because they will never listen. They will never have it. These are the people we're dealing with. We're, we're, we're thinking. It's, it's like when Neil comes out and says, yeah, but we show it to them. And, and yeah, but they see it. And they, yeah, well, they don't want to see it, Neil. We're, we're not dealing with honest people who will be swayed from a long-held position by evidence. Whereas honest people are saying, show me the evidence. I've had this uh, belief a long time, and if you show me I'm wrong, uh, I'll, I'll look at it, but I'm going to really put you to task, make sure your evidence is strong, because majority of people believe what I believe, and if I've been lied to, I'll be thanking you the rest of my life. But if you are just got some cockamamie evidence, then you'll be the, you know, the laughing stock. No, we don't get those people. We get the people that don't want to hear the evidence. There's yeah, I was just saying it. The action. Extremis. You who? Yes, I'm here. I'm just listening. Do you see my message in live stream? Main chat. I see it. Do you understand? I understand. Good. You may continue, Nathan. What does he understand? You don't need to go into it. Well, wow, really. Awkward. Uh, that's it. That's it. That's a clue not to get too extreme. But yeah, Tenth, what I was saying is the uh, for someone to say, don't mention 90, don't talk about right triangles, they, ha they have to cognitively process the problem to say that. Well, remember the first guy that, well, he wasn't the first guy, but he was one of them. He's no longer coming on, uh, but he'd be in the YouTube chat. He'd say, I, I'm, I used a sextant, and I never did what Tenth said. I never did that. You don't do that. There's no, and he was just denying everything. And then he's gone now because citation after citation from people who wrote books on the sextant debunked him. And yet he came in saying, don't say 90, don't say triangle. So do you reckon you can bash together a picture of your house with a molten iron core cutaway? Do you reckon that's a possibility? Or were you just saying? Yes, that? but no, uh, me and Adam was talking about it. And uh, I'm going to have to create a coordinate system for my kitchen um, and then do uh, like a equatorial, um, like a azimuthal. Uh, I'll take that coordinate system and place it onto a, um, a ball and then I can probably take pictures and cut them out and just kind of warp them to fit and then when anybody asks just say you know the model's not perfect John of all the pans in your kitchen do you own a, a wok I do not you should get one what is a wok you don't know what a wok is no what's a wok it's what you do in the morning when you're old to keep the blood flowing. No. 
A wok is what you throw at a wabbit. You both are a few steps behind. Wok is a drink. How do people cook in a wok? A wok is what you throw at a wabbit. What's wrong with you? It's also a drink. It's a slang drink. So this is the citation of Elmer Fudd's office tree. It's you, Neil. I never did that. <laughs> I am Elmer J. Fudd, billionaire. I wouldn't mention any yacht. I never did answer Nathan's question. After I do that with the uh, ball, then I'll be able to cut the ball in half and put, you know, draw whatever pictures I want to inside of it. It'd, be, of it'd, it'd make a great thumbnail. Hey, Neil, I own two yachts, front yacht and back yacht. <laughs> hey, listen, you're going to have to cut it in half because you got your measurements from flat, buddy. No, I'm talking about creating tangent planes and putting them, trying to warp them onto the sphere. I think more is the description I'm giving right now. So let me, ask a, the equatorial plane. let me ask a question. So everywhere on a sphere, nowhere can be flat? That's one of the principal properties of a sphere. But my backyard is flat. No. Not on a sphere, it isn't. But yes, in reality, you're on a flat plane. Glad we cleared that what up. if it's a really big, what if it's a really big sphere? There's no it's flat surfaces be flat on areas a sphere. There. None, ever. I, 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 did I, did I, you I, observe yeah, it as a very big sphere? I, I object to what Neil just said. <laughs> we all object to what Neil just said. You're not thinking with your imaginations. Neil, the, the well, ground has been leveled. <laughs> I had one telling me the other day exactly the same thing. He, he, he was telling me because the earth is so big, um, that when you get on this one, when you measure one degree angle of 69 miles, you, you will just have to presume that it is flat because it's so big. Yes, yeah, so flat then. Welcome to flat. <laughs> <Yeah. Earth. laughs> exactly. How I'm about ask you... where there's the cur where the curvature is, we're supposed to see their responses. Well, it's so big. That you can't see it. Okay. But somehow they measure it? Hmm. That's funny. Yeah, because what happens if you double that 69 miles and presume that it's still flat? It's still flat. Well, I just said, well, how, how did you get your degree? Obviously, you measured an angle. Well, I don't think they uh, claim that they've measured it. It's on the math. Sounds like a. It just sounds like a diagonal line to me. The no, geometry they claim doesn't fit. They are telling us they need to travel 69 miles in a straight line in order to see a, um, a derivation of the angle. So they are increasing the radius now. That's not a curve. That's a diagonal line. Like connect the dots. Connect four. The fucking diagonal line. It's just uh, it's just so funny to listen to what they come back with. Uh, just just keep keep it on the R value, keep it on an angle, and they just don't know what they're saying. Did did you ask them who uh, measured that angle? It started off with R, and he came back with the Eratosthenes. Um, uh, you know um, that you know the Earth is so big that you can presume it's flat, and then he gave me the example of if you measure one degree of 69 miles on the earth that big, it will appear to be flat. So I just said, well, how did you get your degree angle? And he's not come back to me yet. Ah. Well, ask him what's the difference uh, in where's the curve and why it's just a diagonal straight horizontal. It's like a straight line. It's not, there's no curve there. Yeah, I know. Listen, just, this is uh, all just, reasoning. Just... All them trying to reason how something that's a sphere could be flat. 
but it's an impossibility as we've been demonstrating. Right. Yeah. How many straight lines? Exactly. 69 miles with no... I mean, right. Imagine the delusion somebody has to go through if they were to try to convince you that their car is actually a motorcycle. <laughs> like, that, that's, that's the type of delusion we're talking about. Chocolate. Well, it's everybody got can wheel? clearly see it's a motorcycle, oh, but chocolate. you're going to tell me it's a car. Curve. Chocolate, that would be too wheel to believe. <laughs> As Elmer would say, too wheel to believe. <laughs> Hold on. With using accepted you can only methodology deceive those. Okay. You can only deceive those who are already deceiving themselves. John? Using, accept yeah. using accepted methodology and uh, an accepted premise, I showed that my kitchen was a sphere. That's correct. I'm going to do my kitchen. And what did we get as a rebuttal, John? Somebody saying, figure what this is, figure this out, or chew on this for a while. A bunch of lines uh, they, and data. Well, they sent a picture of a, I think it was a broadband uh, reading, and then they it had a cross-sectional reference of the information encoded within that broadband signal. Well, John, I think you use flatware in your kitchen to prove sphericity. The globe calculations only work because the, it's measured flat. Come on. Well, you need flatware. Think about this. You need flatware to get a ball. You need underwear to hold the balls. Neil, jockeying for position is a bad <laughs> idea. Oh, shoot, Jackie, you know, got it, got it. I can't out on you. I can't bear this You need this to job. make a globe cake in your, in, your, in your global kitchen. You should make a globe cake. If I made it, I couldn't eat it, too. A globe pancake? <laughs> no, a globe cake, that'd be pretty hard to do. No way, you just make a pancake and then you calculate it as spherical. It's not that hard. <laughs> No, it's a disc, Arvin. Yeah, but your but your boat's got to disappear on the pancake. That's all. <laughs> well, they're, hey, they're still using that as proofies. You know, the pancake thing is okay, but people would really waffle with that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still waiting for a baller's reaction to the video, though. Like, because anything they say about what I did uh in that video it's you know it's just like a an indictment of their model when they do say something you know well it's an indictment of their processes the process that they follow model. In doing what they do and you reveal it and that's kind of unnerving to the ballers i think i think they're just generally unnerved by it yeah they the want to model they use chocolate. they want to go on john I was just telling Chocolate, the flat earth model they use to claim it's the sphere. It's an indictment of that model. They they think they could heavily stack their argument with a pancake. The fun, the fun thing about globe models is you don't actually need a globe for it. You just need something flat and then you calculate it into a globe. Yeah. Piece of paper. That's all you, well, need. you need a pen and paper. paper. <laughs> the geometric horizon only exists in the math. Where do you do math? On a piece of paper. Yep. So you, you got your globe paper. right there. So you guys should be able to see like how easy it is to get their calculation and just repair it every single time, right? That's what they want you to do. They want to say, well, parrot our calculation. And it if you do anything other than that, if you can find another way to write this math problem, two plus two equals four, then we'll give you $10,000. But there's only one way to write two plus two equals four, and that's the way to write it. So the shit they say is just ignorant. Be careful, you're gonna start another common core fiasco this way. 
It's like once they've done the two sextant sightings and got your circles of equal altitude, they have to put them on a flat map because they can't put it on a globe because you wouldn't be able to plot where you were because it won't work. Well, in order to keep the masses dumb, they rate on the curve. So there's your common core. Yeah, where's the molten common core? The molten common core. That subject's too hot to handle, Arwen. <laughs> Remember when they used to say the model works? Yeah, but it works. Yeah, I have a question it works about like core. a slave in chains. It has to do whatever you input to it. Yeah, it works like that. It doesn't actually function, though, but it works. But come to think of it, think of all their proofs. It's all like illusional things or add this up or calculate that or this could never happen on a flat plane or... It can only happen on a sphere. Now, it thrives on the preponderance of thought experiments based upon the presuppositional conception of it, right? So they, you, they dig within the imaginary as to what should be possible with it. That's where its real strength comes from, from the ability to make everybody imagine how it works in utter detail. That's its only real strength. Well said, Alwyn. Well freaking said. Yeah, I, I missed a lot with the fog, fog experiments. The globe's strongest proof is that it can't, it doesn't exist and doesn't have a proof. <laughs> no, its strongest proof is that everybody wants it to be real. My favorite part of that is that everybody thinks it's real because some guy a long, long time ago supposedly liked balls, thought the ball was a perfect shape. And he thought if God would make a shape, the earth a shape, it'd be a ball. Yes. It's a, <laughs> Clowns. It's a spherical that, is the shape of the gods. Who was that? Was that Pythagoras? Was it? Yes, sir. Nathan, you around? Yeah. He's making a thumbnail. You making a thumbnail? No. <laughs> so cute. You go go ahead and pull up the um I put something in Master B. Get ready for this little train wreck of a dumpster fire argument from abject retards. Tell me when master you got it. Master B up. now. Say again? You say it's in Master B. Yeah, I put it nine eight, eighteen minutes after you. Okay. Give me a sec. Yeah. Did anybody follow? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah, it's up. All right. So what they're saying now is <laughs> I had somebody post this to me. So one of the idiot ball tards. So they asked, they posted this photo, or I'm sorry, diagram, and they said, asked me, where's the right triangle? So be ready for that. I know it's really <laughs> stupid. I thought I'd share it with you. Oh, my gosh. They don't see where they're using the, their, like, their celestial horizon to create a right triangle uh, it's right there on top and it's right there in the center is this a joke uh, hey listen i'm just giving you what i was challenged with they're, they're really there's literally a right triangle right on the top <laughs> Sorry, what? don't forget the one in the center the presupposed globe too they got two right triangles here well, uh, that, that, no, they don't. The reason why is they don't close the opposite side. <laughs> See on the top, you have no opposite side coming down. It's open. <follow <laughs> Yeah, I highlight to do it. So they give you, 
So if you're going to claim that the observation's taken from the position that says, as labelled, observer's position, well then, that's going to give you a right angle triangle out to the GP of the position of this star. But the diagram's not using that as the angle measurement, it's using it as the light rays from distant body star in brackets. <laughs> So therefore, you've actually got a transposition to the centre of the presupposed spherical Earth at C. That's where the angle measurement actually takes place. The angle measurement being H, and then there's no closed line between GP and C, celestial horizon line. That's what he's talking about. This is left open. Well, you're measuring the GP position from... Well, it's labelled GP, <laughs> but there's no line, as QE's pointing out. No. Yeah, they're, they're showing, they're highlighting, as you can see, the Z, the zenith angle, which is a complement. They're not highlighting the right angle, the elevation angle. Well, basically, they've demonstrated why it doesn't work on a sphere um, or why you would, couldn't navigate on a sphere with it as proof of what? Lack of right angle. Well, like I said earlier in the show, they say it's on your meridian. But as we know, the zenith angle is achieved with a complement right angle. So meridians can't be bent. Sorry, Charlie. I also see another problem. Where's the geometric horizon? If this is their sphere belief, where's the geometric horizon? They've got celestial and ge uh, geodoid geoidal horizon. But where's the where's the sphere edge horizon? Oh, it's just not labelled in this. Oh, I see. It's refracted. So it's deviated from straight? <laughs> not there at all it's not even labeled well it's odd that somebody would think QE... this is not this is just a, a geometric projection it excludes terrestrial refraction so it's not optical even though it's an yeah. optical instrument right but the the whole thing is like they sent this to qe to try to disprove right triangles by demonstrating that you couldn't use a sextant on a spherical earth yeah, that's what it proves. Look at the radius uh, from the GP to the observer's position. They, they have a bent radius. Yeah, I know. It's that. All, kind, all kinds of problems here. Looks like a diagram of a piece of an eyeball with some lines. Well, it's the four quadrants of a circle. Forget the sphere talk, it's a circle. You've got four quadrants. Each quadrant gives you a 90. That one going through the middle, they're trying to tell us that's the equator. Well, when that, that drawing becomes any kind of Earth, let me know. What's this bit at the bottom? A circle of equal altitude side view. This. Presumably extends out into a massive circle. Well, how is that? They can, how is that they in can relation? That makes no sense. Well, you remember early on, the guy came with the glass and put it on the orange, and he took a permanent marker and made a circle, and then he took another glass with smaller circumference to it and put that and made another circle and said, "See, these are like latitude lines, and there's your circle of equal altitude." Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not are, equal altitude. No, no, I get that, but what I'm saying is, if you look at the distance from C to uh, to GP position marked here. This is the angle measurement you're taking, right? H. So how does that bear any relation to this depictoral example of the circle of equal altitude if the measurement is being taken between C and GP with the angle H? It bears no relation to this circle of equal altitude that's being claimed, especially as that circle of equal altitude has parallel light rays from all from one star or all stars, it doesn't really make it clear. It just says star. What star? Well, there's, could, there's five lines. 
Number one, light doesn't come in parallel, it's divergent, so they're gone. No one does anything from the center of anything, so they're gone. But what, they're, what they can't do here is show a three-dimensional sphere, so they used a circle. And then where it says GP, that line of this you know, cockeyed circle that never really shows you an exact circle, that's supposed to be the center of that circle of equal altitude. It just doesn't show it right. I mean, the pictures we show from their books is much better than this. But yeah, this none of terrible. that is happening. This is terrible, QB. Whoever gave you this, maybe they just gave it you in this appalling format for reasons to obfuscate and confuse. I don't know. It's terrible, though. I think it was more of a knee-jerk reaction from somebody just first hearing the information. You know, kind of, well, this, this doesn't have a triangle on it. Yeah, well, that was the original question QE said. Well, you know, where's your right angle triangle? Well, between the point mark GP and the line C for angle H. That's your triangle. Just no line drawn. So what? This is where they look at drawings and they're ballers and they look at drawings like holy scripture. This is true no matter what. And then we start breaking it down. And they go back to these drawings and say, yeah, but they wouldn't put these drawings. They wouldn't be lying to us. See, this is the, they're stuck here. Instead of using critical thinking and seeing two triangles here, one on the surface, which is the only one you can ever get, then they transpose it to the center of something that doesn't exist. So they make two of them and saying that they're corresponding to each other. Oh, but light has to come in parallel for that to work. Well, well light doesn't come in parallel. Well, light not only has to come in parallel, they have to mark it out with, all of these different black dots with, with what a claim that this is the same star. It's like you've got five parallel lines, one of which that goes to the center with the actual measurement at H, but claim to be actually on the surface of this ball that's redundant if used to measure to measure this angle H. It's like, why? What are you actually doing? You're holding a sextant and pointing it at one star, but in your depiction you've got five of them, one of which is moving to a center position. It makes absolutely no sense. This is this is just so far removed from reality. It's untrue. But That's based on right. this, it's the question of where'd you get a right angle triangle here, just just here in your diagram. But your diagram makes no sense. We don't even need to go this far. The minute you said, as you started, you said angle measurement it was over right there. I am going to use this though. Uh, it's light rays from distant body. I'm just going to erase the star and put ceiling fan. And then instead of the uh, geoidal horizon, I'm going to use uh, the geoidal wall. Yeah. And when, where you've got these little star shapes, just replace them with multiple ceiling light fan shapes to make it clear that there's five ceiling fans rather than the one that you're actually measuring the angle to. And obviously the one in the middle of those five is the one going to the center of your presupposed spherical earth that you're deriving from this flat plane measurement. The flat plane in this instance on this diagram being this line and this line, the actual lines used for angle measurements. None of the surface of the sphere is being utilized, only a line that sits on top of it or dissecting the middle of it. That's where the actual angle measurements are being described in this diagram. Sod all to do with anything spherical and everything to do with these flat straight lines. Nathan, can you go five slides back from this? I see the pictures below. So you got two of UE's open panel, then some writing, then you got an image called Azimuth Altitude for Northern Latitudes. On Celestial Air Navigation or before that? No, one, one before that. Azimuth and altitude for northern latitudes, got it. <clears throat> so here it is. Here's the ground plane. Now, just bear with me. This is their equator. This is their equatorial plane here. They cut the globe in half. They're at the center, and they're taking the sextant measurement from the center. Now, of course, none of this is happening, but they have to have a ground plane. Now, we know that you're doing that on the surface of the earth, which is a plane. And that's why sextants work on flat earth only, not curved adjacents. So the only way around it is to say that they're getting it from the center, even though they're never at the center. But let's go on. So the ground plane is here. Now you got a 90, and now you can take an altitude measurement. 
So there's your horizon, and then there's your elevation angle, which is the altitude. It doesn't give you zenith distance, okay? You got direction from north going um, clockwise to get your azimuth, the bearing, and that's on a flat plane. And then you've got the zenith angle, the zenith distance, which is the complement or co-altitude. So you minus your altitude from 90, your vertical, and whatever that zenith co-altitude is, let's say in this case, 40 degrees, okay? So just making it up. So what's 40 times 60, 2,400 nautical miles. So you're 2,400 nautical miles from the GP of that sun that you see there. Now that sun, GP, is a straight line down somewhere on that flat uh, you know, plane there. But what I want everyone to understand is this dark arrow that differentiates the vertical and the altitude with the two arrows on either end. You see how that's curving? That's supposed to be a meridian. The longitude that if you cut it, cuts all the way across the center of the earth. Okay, not a small circle, but a great circle. There's one big problem with this. That zenith angle on top is a right triangle. It can never work with a curved surface either. Another yeah, lie. very good. Anybody want to add anything? What else is there to add? Earth they have is, nowhere to go. Earth is flat. Must be for these measurements. With that, though, I'm going to say another huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And, of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premier Streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Also, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier by hitting the link in the info box below this video. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video.